All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so my, my talk, uh, metadata across the full stack, not the application stack, the full stack. So this talk is kind of like uh, twofold. Um, it's covering a lot of patterns that I've been working in in the last, uh, especially the last five years, um, but drilling down into the detail of uh, a solution we delivered here at Ignar. It's gone off again. Back. Um, so, um, yes, so we, Ignark are a charity based in London, uh, and they have been running for uh, 25 years, and their business is collecting data uh, from the NHS. So, fundamentally, a data driven company. They've been doing lots of research, lots of peer reviewed, complicated statistical stuff, um, and it's all based upon the, uh, 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 the data that they collect. So their business is based in two halves. One half is the audits, um, which are repeated collections of data periodically um, over many, many years. And then they do loads of more ad hoc research where they define the study, they define what data they're going to collect. They collect the data for a certain amount of time and then they uh, report upon that. And sometimes the studies become longer running because they have found insights and so on. They tweak the studies, and so they change and they move on. The really interesting thing about ICNARC is the data at the end is really high quality. The business rules they have behind that validate the data that comes in are extremely extensive and are also changing because they see the data, they learn things, and then they realize, hang on, this is something new that we've not seen before. The data is always changing, always being collected in different ways. Um, and so they put in new rules to catch that case uh, and to prevent it coming again. So the rules themselves are always changing. Um, and what is very interesting when I joined ICNAR um, is that their the architecture was, was relatively old, old systems, not using modern data-driven tools. Um, but they did have a business rules framework. So they had implemented a really powerful business rules framework that let the business uh, configure the rules uh, and deploy them uh, to production. Great. But wider than just what we've been doing at ICNARC um, is the way I see this evolving picture of where we are these days with data. So uh, five years ago, give or take, uh, it was very much uh, analytics or business intelligence and the application, no communication. Uh, it was down to the BI guys to draw the data out of the application and if it wasn't there, well, you just had to deal with it. But now, so the stack was a bit like a funnel and it, and, 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 uh, and it was very much one way. But now, all the, uh, the application is fundamentally data centric. So analytics and data engineering and everything is now part of the application. If the application isn't fundamentally data driven, it's not going to survive much longer. Um, and that has meant that these two teams coming together, working together, and both sides uh, learning from each other. So we are deploying data tools within the application, but also as data guys, we are learning tools that the developers of a traditional application uh, have been using and, and te techniques that thereafter. Um, and in fact, yeah, it's more of a circle. So the data now goes back into the application, it triggers things, uh, and, and it goes, go, it goes full, full round. So at this point, I was going to do a demo. Uh, I, was, I was really keen to do a demo. I've not seen many demos here today, but my connectivity is not working, so um, never mind. <laughs> so I'll try and explain the demo. So what we had at ICNARC is uh, this data collection system. Uh, the data set consists of about 300 points of data um, and there are about 600 business rules that validate that data. Not every single piece of data is relevant to every record, it depends on the attributes and so on and so forth. Um, so we wanted a way and we wanted to be more flexible in how we can receive this data. So at the moment it gets delivered as an XML file, um, which is fine. So we can read that file, we can process it and validate it and so on. Um, 
But we also wanted to allow what we're we were calling direct entry, which is where we want a UI where they can type the data in if they really want to type in 300 attributes per record. Probably not. Um, and in doing that, if, if we're going to have multiple ways of receiving the data, we really needed a standardized way of validating it when it comes in and so on. Um, so we built a solution that would use um, various technologies to define metadata that would display the form on the screen, but it also defines metadata that is used to validate the XML file. Uh, it defines where the XSD is for the XML file and so on. And in fact, we're even able to generate the XSD from the data. So if IGNOT decide to, there's a pandemic, uh, we haven't had a pandemic for a few years, but previously there was uh, bird flu and so on. Um, and what they really wanted to do was push out an audit to collect information about that may or may not be related to uh, causes of the pandemic and so on, and gather that data as quickly as possible. Now they can do that because they can quickly create a new data set. They can define the rules. The business can do all of this themselves. There's no code. Um, and they push out the data set, and then when the users, when they log on, they will then see a new form that is automatically generated, uh, and away they go. So, so yes, so why did, they, why did they want this? So that from the business perspective, it was all about being able to respond to change. The last time the business asked the development team to produce a data set like this, by the time the development team would have done it, it the time would have passed. So it was a very negative culture. The development was taking far too long to deliver changes. Now, they, the, the business can do it themselves. This also means the business can focus on the business of running an audit and collecting data and getting it clean, uh, rather than worrying about the technology. Um, and it also then means that IT, or development, in supporting the system uh, change from being a, oh no, we can't do that because of this reason, that reason, whatever reason, to being a much more positive environment where they now can deliver these things because we've got the modern architecture uh, and all of that. And then the last one is obviously the, the end users were happier. And when we introduced this system, um, the key benefit that they got was they uploaded their file and they got immediate feedback on all of their failed business rules. Uh, all the problems in their data file. That previously took two weeks, um, and they received that feedback previously in a PDF. Just not a modern platform. Now they get the immediate feedback. So we had beta users who were coming up to us and asking us, several of them, um, can we just drop the old system and go straight onto the new system? Uh, and I think when they're doing that, that that's, <laughs> that's a great sign. Um, so what's the benefit of this approach for the developers? Well, it's good for the developers as well. So uh, the developers will now focus their time on new features in the application and the stack, the analytics, um, not onboarding new data sets or dealing with change from the business and all that sort of thing. Um, and then these new features, because we've got a single system, uh, a common uh, engine, if you like, these new features then would benefit all audits and all users if, if the feature is relevant to them. So again, um, and uh, Ignite, the funding is very important because you are funded by grants and things like that, so you have to show how you're spending the money. So if you can show that you can share a development cost between multiple audits, then it's a win-win. Um, and it naturally fits into agile processes. So I said we had 300 attributes in the data, but we didn't need those 300 attributes to develop the solution. We could develop against five, prove everything works, you know, get all the bits and pieces uh, working together, and then we can bring in the rest of the metadata to get the full solution. So the most important thing really is getting the data model right. And by just complete randomness, I came across this article on um, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I don't even know the Bill Carwin. I don't even know who that was, but it was a great article, and it was about extensible data modeling. And this is exactly what we implemented at IGNOT. Uh, this talks about all the different ways you can, you can be flexible in your schema so that uh, when you're storing the data, you're not necessarily, to deal with change, you're not necessarily having schema changes uh, in order to store that data. Um, 
so even if you have a flexible storage uh, layer, um, it's very important though to keep track of what you're storing in there. We don't want a free for all. Um, <laughs> we remember MongoDB rise uh, a few years ago, uh, and actually getting things out of there where you've got the same attributes stored under different keys um, in a massive database um, proved very hard. So even though we've got a flexible schema, it's not. We've still got to be controlled and uh, keep track of what's where. So what technologies did we use to build this? Well, the storage was actually just a relational database. It's actually didn't really matter what it, which one it was. We built this on SQL Server because uh, for some reason everyone in healthcare or everyone in the NHS just de facto uses SQL Server and if you don't, they look at you with a bit of a strange look. I don't know why. Um, but for this demo, uh, or the demo that I did have, um, I migrated it in and it took half an hour to migrate it over to Postgres. Um, but it doesn't even need to be a relational database, to be fair. But the, the, the shape of the, data, of the metadata especially is fundamentally relational. For the form generation, we use something called Alpaca.js. Um, so there are a, a million form generators out there. Um, it's very hard to pick one, but Alpaca.js Alpaca is currently still maintained. It's a very active project, um, and it is very, very flexible. You can, you can push all of our business rules from the server end up into the client uh, to allow them to have a better idea that their data is going to be accepted when they submit it uh, straight away rather than waiting to get the feedback from the server. Um, and then we also used a uh, JSON schema um, in the back end. Again, that allows us to have a single file that defines the shape of the data and that can be applied against uh, lots of different input formats. The orchestration and the dealing with the logic of receiving data and running our business rules and everything, we used uh, Kettle uh, from uh, previously uh, from uh, Pentaho. Um, and then the rules framework, we used uh, their existing rules framework. So I said they already had a really good rules framework. So uh, we just reused what they already had. Um, and the benefit of that was they already had it, they already knew it, all the bugs have been ironed out. And if we had to migrate 600 rules from one framework to another, the testing of that would have been absolutely huge. And we couldn't really show any benefit from doing this. We did look at rules and we looked at um, uh, JRE, which is a, um, a Java rules framework that integrates with Kettle. Um, but there was no benefits, so we stuck with what we had. And actually, we made the rules framework uh, pluggable. So Kettle is, is fundamentally a very metadata-driven tool. Uh, in fact, actually, the, when you build transformations and jobs, uh, that is metadata that describes how your jobs work. Um, and there's features like metadata injection, which enable you to write dynamic uh, transformations and so on. It's all very, uh, it, it is very, very good at dealing with change. Um, However, all of these practices of uh, writing code that uh, can be flexible and understands the metadata in the incoming stream and so on, uh, that it's only a technique and it is applicable everywhere. So doesn't, you don't have to use Kettle. You could, you, you could write metadata-driven solutions in Python, Talent, whatever. It's just that Kettle makes it really, really easy because it's fundamentally part of the product. But it's definitely a technique that needs to be uh, considered across your whole stack. Um, and on the Alpaca.js side, yeah, so we've used a lot of features in Alpaca.js. Um, this actually is based upon JSON schema. So even though JSON schema will define the format of a schema and the data types and so on, um, there's extensions to that JSON schema that allow you to define much richer things that Alpaca.js will use to render your form. Um, so there's obviously things like field types and, and all that and values for selectors and so on. There's dependencies, which is great, uh, and there's tabbed views and all that. But the one negative point about a form generator is always, ah, oh, but what if I don't want it to lay out like that? What if I don't want the automatic layout? What if I want to be able to just put fields wherever I want? And this is important to ignore because some of the research projects are actually based upon paper forms because the NHS is still not paper free. Um, and they like the UI to match the paper form for simplicity, which to a degree makes a lot of sense. So 
What's great about our package AS is they even have this model view technology whereby you can actually uh, you can actually code the layout. Uh, and you can, so you can have your form with all the power of it still doing all the logic of gathering your data, doing your validation and everything. And yet, you can still control exactly how it looks. So it's a win-win situation. And I use that argument to win over some of our front-end developers uh, who were a bit anti losing the control of creating the page. So I was... This originally, uh, this was titled Full Stack. So I've been talking about the application here, really, about how we gather the data and how we deal with change in the application. Um, but what about everything else? So what about ingestion? What about if we want to get loads of data sources into our data lake? Well, we resolved that back in 2014. So the idea of a metadata-driven ingestion framework, we have built one way back then. Uh, and in fact, the solution we built is actually available in GitHub. Um, and basically, you can scan a multitude of source systems, whether they're relational databases, Excel files, CSV, flat files, whatever, uh, and automatically load them into Hadoop, create the tables, and publish them and make them available. Uh, and it's all driven off metadata. There's two sides to it, as always. There's defining the metadata, and then there's processing that metadata and, and building your, your pipelines. So ingestion is sorted, so that's fine. So we can get all of our data into our uh, data lake or, uh, or whatever. Um, and what about analytics? Well, again, um, there are solutions for metadata-driven analytics. So uh, in AWS uh, Glue, um, they now have some crawlers which will scan your data and work out what's in it. I was quite um, dubious about how well this would work, um, but I've been using it for the last few weeks, and actually it does a really good job of detecting um, the delimiter in the file, uh, the headings if they're there, and even better, if you give it some massive nested complicated JSON, it will read that and it will create you a table that has got all the arrays defined, so you can read that whole nested structure, you can read it immediately via Athena, um, which is just incredible. Uh, it makes life so easy. You don't want to be creating JSON paths uh, to access this file. Uh, just do it automatically. Um, and then on the front end, so the, the, in uh, Pento, there's something called Streamlined Data Refinery. Uh, but there's similar features in uh, other products. Um, but all this is about is simply taking your stream of data, taking your metadata. You know the columns. You know the data types. You might know the dimensionality. And from that, you can then generate a cube, and you can automatically publish a cube. So if you combine the streamlined data refinery with the automatic ingestion, what you can do is not only get the data into your data lake, but you can expose it with a cube on your front end all in one, all in one go. Um, it works best with you know, singular sources of data. Um, but as always, getting something simple up and running so you can analyze your data, work out what's there, is still really powerful. And then you can build the more complicated stuff in the more sort of traditional way afterwards. And the other thing that is important, and in fact, um, I heard um, just earlier spoken about uh, uh, ODPI, which is a standard for sharing metadata. So Mike Ferguson was talking about um, uh, with all these silos, you uh, there's no sharing of metadata. So even if everyone is managing and maintaining their metadata, which not all the silos are, um, there's no sharing. So you're doing the work multiple times. So ODPI is a um, framework for a st an open source standardized framework for sharing metadata. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it soon. But this is exactly something we, we would need to do because sharing metadata is really important. Um, in the example of uh, Ignark, uh, we've got all of our field definitions. Well, those field definitions need to go over to the rule engine so the rule engine knows what fields you can build your rules on. So, uh, and that's all exposed via you know, simple APIs and so on. And the more you share your data and create APIs and make this available, the more it will get used and, and basically the richer your system becomes. And so what about the cloud? How does this fit in with the cloud? So, um, again, going to the AWS example, uh, and in fact, it, it's the same in um, Google Cloud and Azure. They've just got different names. But the Glue Data Catalog is now a top-level citizen that is shared between many services. 
So this is compatible with and probably pretty much is a Hive Metastore. Um, so in AWS, if you spin up Elastic Map Reduce cluster, then the Hive Metastore is your Glue data catalog. So it shares, comes from there. Athena is driven from the Glue data catalog. Your AWS Glue ETL processes all use the data catalog. And I think it's very interesting that that has now become a, a top level citizen. Um, and be beyond that, you can tell um, they have made, you know, they can tell they know how important this is because the whole um, data catalog is accessible by a really extensive API. So they are encouraging you to come in and either populate the data catalog or use it for your application. Um, so it's not just the crawlers that populate the data catalog, it, it could be a multitude of different uh, systems. And the same in uh, Gcloud as well. And so what, what lessons have we learned from this? So um, the first one with any metadata-driven solution is to choose your battles. Um, if you, you want to try and make the whole thing metadata-driven, the business might say, yeah, we need to be able to configure everything. And we need to be able to make everything configurable, not just the data set. We might want to configure the workflow, what happens when they submit the data, which page it goes to. They're, it's like, right, OK. Well, you can only do so much. So pick your battles, do your quick wins. You will never make everything generic. If you do, you might end up with Jira. And how many times have you used Jira and found someone's built a, f a funky workflow and you've ended up stuck in a status of a Jira that you can't get out again? Or you have to go back in the process and then go forwards again to, to get out again. So beware too much customization because uh, your users will shoot themselves in their foot. Um, so we use templates a lot, obviously. So sometimes um, it, it can be as simple as a template. And we might not be using metadata injection or something. We might just be using a variable. Uh, but there's still a degree of configurability. It's still very important. And make sure you standardize your data. Uh, for, well, I, I said format, so I think that's the wrong word. Um, I'm really talking about naming as well here. So um, you sh uh, if you've got an object called customer underscore ID uh, in multiple systems across your whole uh, solution, then make sure that is the same object. Not that it's a customer ID that is generated here, but a different customer ID over here. So if they're different objects, they must have different names. Uh, obviously, not always the case. Um, but yeah, formats are important as well. So again, if you can stick to a data format across your whole stack, then great. Um, just makes everything a whole lot easier. Um, and especially with dates and times, um, your time zone is extremely important. Um, and deployment. So connected with deployment, really, what we're talking about is just following best practices um, in development. So. Um, you must control your schema deployments. You must use something like DB Deploy or whatever so that your databases are all controlled and are all kept in sync. As because otherwise, you end up with a field that is missing in production. You don't realize straight away. And then someone runs the monthly process and it falls down because the field's not there. So you've really got to get on top of your deployment. Um, and it's the same with the metadata. So if your metadata is different in different environments, you're going to get different behavior. And you're going to think, oh, but the code's the same. What's going on? It, it, you've got to control that deployment. So use something like um, uh, continuous integration, Jenkins, whatever. Um, or in fact, actually, with Atlassian, you can use uh, their solutions. And they all tie together really nicely. Uh, and so that's all I've got. So I think I'm about out of time anyway. If there's any questions, great. If not, I'll be around afterwards. So come and chat to me. Thank you very much.